And it's a great uh, pleasure to have Lowell Taylor as our speaker today. Lowell is a professor of economics and public policy at Carnegie Mellon. And he was on the Council of Economic Advisors under President Clinton. And um, he uh, works in labor economics, but he also has a very big focus in economic demography and some of the work actually viewed as being in either field. And um, he did pathbreaking work on the demography of gay and lesbian households and then subsequent work also on economics of those households. I think that first article maybe was presented here as a brown bag by Seth oh, Sanders. Yeah. So, yeah. That chance. was quite a while yeah. ago. The chance. Yeah. Um, and he's also worked on other, lots of other topics in um, related to health care, related to the way labor markets function, how labor markets can produce um, race ethnic differentials in unemployment, um, even I guess without discriminatory, yeah, overt discriminatory yeah. behavior and such things. And the topic today is, um, Perhaps it's a new one for you, at least. It is, yeah. yeah. More mortality is new for me. <laughs> uh, so, Great Migration and African American Mortality, Evidence from the Deep South. And I forgot to say, Lowell is here uh, visiting at Berkeley and teaching a course in labor economics in the economics department right now. Yeah, Not this minute, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm hoping I'll get a chance to meet uh, more of you over the course of the semester. Uh, you may have noticed me kicking around the, the seminar a couple of times before this. Um, also, I could add, I was actually, um, although I, I guess I do most of my work in labor economics, I was actually trained in demography in Michigan. So oh. I, I, I arrived the day you left, I think. Uh, we, we never quite crossed. Um, or maybe the year after you left, a year before you left, but I, you weren't there by the time I took demography courses. Um, and I did work with David Lamb, who some of you may remember from, from being a student here back in the day. And yeah. he's, he's obviously in Michigan now. Well, anyway, here's a topic. Um, you, you, uh, some of you may know my uh, collaborator Seth and, and, and Dan, um, both, both of whom I suspect have come through and did talks at one point or another, maybe you've seen the PAA. The, the other uh, misfit is my son. So he, he had been he'd been hired at, at, at Duke to do some work for, uh, for Seth Sanders and Jim Bopel doing some data work. And, Eventually, he did, he did a, a boatload of work on this paper and came to kind of, kind of cool things. He's now an author, so that's, that's fun for me. All right, well, the, the, the background here um, is, is one that's going to be familiar to, to, to everybody in this room, I think, and that is that if we think about uh, what's happened to the African-American um, population over the course of the 20th century, we know that at the very beginning of the 20th century, uh, something on the order of 90% of all African-Americans uh, lived in the South, and, and that cohort in the earliest 20th century was born in the South. And then, and then over the 20th century, uh, two, two things happened that, that are sort of a, a, a central to African-American um, history. One is, of course, the Great Migration. So sometime, um, uh, depending on precisely how uh, you define it, um, sometime over the first uh, half of the 20th century, um, uh, something like six million um, African-Americans migrated out of the South to northern states and, and to western states. And then, of course, over the uh, 20th century, um, there, was, there was a narrowing of the enormous disparities that, that existed um, um, on all possible socioeconomic uh, dimensions, um, education, human capital uh, of various sorts, health, and, and, and so on. And of course, both of these things are very uh, tightly linked. So there are many papers, for example, that study what the effect of the Great Migration was on labor market outcomes for African Americans themselves and for the communities to which they migrated. Um, and, 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 and there's no work that I know of that, that looks at the uh, effect of the Great Migration on health and mortality itself. And, and uh, so, so that, that's what the paper is going to be about. And sort of by the end, after you sort of see what we're up to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hope to uh, persuade you that's kind of an interesting thing to have done. And it's, it's important or we're, we're maybe even central to understanding the evolution of, of black-white um, um, health gaps. So as a background, there are sort of four kind of uh, strands of literature that, that, that this seems, uh, that seems to, to, to be sitting back in, the, in, 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 well, in the background that would be useful for thinking about what, what we're up to. And, and none of the four things I'm about to say, again, are, are, is going to be a surprise to, to, to anybody here. Um, first is, is concerns racial disparities themselves. Um, if we go back to the, to the cohorts, to the time when the cohorts we're studying were born, say 1920, there are enormous life expectancy differences in the U.S. So if you look at, and these are now from period life tables, so take them for, for what they are, 
Um, uh, the, 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 the life expectancy gaps are very big uh, um, between blacks and whites. Um, in, in 1920, of course, mortality improved a lot for both blacks and whites, um, and the, the, the gap narrowed. Um, so, so that by most recent uh, uh, statistics, uh, the, the uh, period life tables are, 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 are giving life expectancy numbers that narrow. Um, there are many detailed studies in epidemiology and medicine that look at the sort of proximate causes, um, and blacks have disadvantages on, on virtually everything that you can uh, uh, list um, in terms of, of major causes of death. Also, what's been well known for a long time to demographers is that these patterns um, seem to have a geographic con uh, component to it. So, so Geronimus and Bound have many papers. This is just the most recent one where they sort of point out things like that if you do sort of something like a period life table for a location, it's a little bit of a dicey thing when you think about it. People are moving in and out, but you know if, what it's doing is it's a sort of a summary statistic for what the, the mortality rates are in a location. Life expectancy can be very, very low. Um, this, this paper by McCord and Friedman um, looked at, uh, um, at Harlem and, and showed that life expectancies for, for black men were, were as low as Bangladesh. It's it quite, quite um, where, where was that, did you say? Oh, this was the important treatment, if I'm remembering right, was, was, was for, for Harlem, and they were looking at mortality from oh, the 70s, and they were saying, if you just looked at the, it was the yeah. probability of survival at age 40, I think is what they, and they came up was lower in Harlem than in Bangladesh, which is, which made a, a properly made an enormous splash. Now again, you sort of have to think about what's happening here. Healthier people could be moving out, and, and less healthy people get stuck in, in Harlem, but, but that's, that's kind of the point, is that, that these race disparities do seem to have a, 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 a location component to them. Now, of course, there's a second uh, 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 literature lurking on in the background that, again, is very, very well known in demography, and that is that mortality is, uh, is generally worse in poor countries and rich countries. It's worse for poor within a country. It's worse for poor people than for, for wealthy people. Um, and, and, and even more so for education, that, that poorly educated people tend to have higher mortality rates than, than well-educated people. Causality, of course, is difficult to sort out. So there's this nice paper by Adriana Large Muni that, that sort of tries to think about whether or not, um, uh, uh, now just for whites, whether or not changes in school uh, schooling laws that induce additional education might affect mortality. And, and the, the, the results in that paper are probably not quite right, but the idea is a very good one. And, and it's, it's starting the literature where people are looking uh, more carefully at, at the approach from that perspective. <laughs> There's this really interesting idea that that forget about education, um, even as your life progresses, if things are going well for you, it makes you happier, and somehow that in turn has a direct causal effect on your, on your health. Um, so Michael Marmot has this sort of famous work where civil servants either get kind of promoted or not, and actually Michael Anderson, who's an economist um, on campus here, has, has redone some of that work, uh, uh, trying to look at it from a model, using a more modern uh, methods, and, and, and it seems to be something there, which is kind of neat, not mortality per se, this is a heart disease, is what they're looking at, but still, that's, that ought to be associated. Um, and then, of course, there's a, there's a strong idea that, that all of this is, is part of what's contributing to, to racial differences in mortality. If blacks are less well-educated, have poor, poor socioeconomic status, and are assaulted with all kinds of things that make their lives less uh, uh, secure, and then that, that, that ought to matter as well. Um, and, and again, causal links are very tough to, um, to, to, uh, uh, to pin down. Our idea is going to be look, to look at people who were born in the South and moved North, and, and as the title of the paper suggests, we're going to try to figure out whether or not that was good for your health. If so, the, another thing we got to sort of think about, at least, is, is this idea of the long reach, the idea from Barker and Vogel and, and, and many, many others, Preston um, has, has a number of papers on this, where, where, the, where the concern is that, that, that really your, your, your health status is kind of set when you're young, like maybe very young, maybe like in utero, that'd be the most extreme version of these stories. And nobody thinks it's exactly completely set. But the point would be to the extent that that long reach idea is truly important and, 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 and sort of dominates, then, then actually moving north might not have much of an effect. Doing anything after age 20 might not have much of an effect given that so much of your health is determined by the health capital established in, in an early age. Um, so I, um, anyway, that's working in the background. And the finally, final thing, of course, is the, is the migration itself. So. Demographers have been on this for as long as demography has been in existence. Um, and it's the idea that, 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 that when people move, the people who are moving are themselves select. So we think of migration as an investment. Um, and and, and uh, you're giving up something, your, your security, your, your, your family, your community, all those, you know, possibly a good job at home, in, in hopes that life is going to be better elsewhere. 
Who is it that moves? Well, it's typically going to be the, the people who are more ambitious, the people who, who are more forward-looking, and therefore, it could be people who are he healthier. So, for example, William Farr um, was the Registrar General in, in the UK. Uh, he, he's the one that collected the data that Jon Snow used, uh, that kind of basically early GIS to figure out that cholera was waterborne, um, which, which, by the way, William Farr thought it was not. So he collected the data thinking he was going to show uh, uh, a John Snow drawing, and, and well, you know, I'm getting distracted. Um, uh, <laughs> That's a pretty cool story. But by the time you get enough data, it's, it's clear that, that, that color was waterborne. It's a huge breakthrough. Well, this is a smart guy, is, is the upshot. So in one of his, every year he, he released these reports, uh, uh, and, and one of them was, was trying to figure out, well, what, what's going on with these people who are, who are moving in from the country to London? They seem to be healthier than people who are in London themselves. And he noticed that part of it could be selection. That, that it's, it's, you know, people in the country might be not that healthy at all, but the more healthy ones are moving in. And he was, by the way, convinced that cities were extremely unhealthy for people. Um, and, and he was right, um, uh, at, least, at, least in the case of London, at least in the case of London in the, in the, in the 19th century. And it was all from the sort of color work that this sort of persuaded him. Um, um, uh, anyway, so, so there's a more recent paper that kind of makes the same point uh, by Halliday and Kim, and m m many other papers in demography kind of worry about this. Okay, so against all that backdrop, what we're going to be trying to do is to um, I'm just going to take a deep breath and say it. Find a causal effect of, of, of migration um, on, on mortality. And I'm going to try to tell you precisely what it is by, I mean by causal effect by going through a kind of a little short model. <coughs> so the model is where I start, and it's going to be a model of, of human capital investment and migration. And the upshot of the model is that we're going to need an instrument to uh, identify the impact of migration. That is to say, something that, that causes some people to move who wouldn't have otherwise moved. Um, then I'll tell you about the data, I'll give you the basic results about, uh, kind of descriptive results about you know, what's the age at which these uh, cohorts were moving, uh, what are the labor market outcomes that you can observe in historical censuses as we work our way through the 20th century. And, and, and then we're going to finally get to this effect of migration on mortality. And just to give you a preview for our instrument, our instrument's going to be the proximity of birthplace to a railroad. So the idea is going to be, just to set it uh, for, for future uh, uh, references, to, is if you're born near a railway, it's easier, less costly, either, either from monetary means or costly psychological means, it's less costly to move to the north if you're born near a railway than if you're born a long way from a railway. That's going to be the idea for our instrument. And of course, we're going to have to talk about whether or not that makes any sense. Um, uh, uh, and, then, and then, of course, there's going to be the estimates themselves, and that's going to take uh, actually very little time, so. <laughs> um, but the setup's fun, so we'll do that. All right, so that's the idea. Uh, barge on ahead? Yeah. All right, then. So here's the model. Uh, the model's like, like, uh, like pretty, pretty simple here, and, and nothing's going to be uh, too, too uh, uh, earth-shaking. Uh, here in capital. Okay, so here, here's the way I want to sort of think about this. Think about a life um, happening in, in uh, two stages. When you're young, you accumulate human capital, and then when you're older, you, uh, you earn some money. And, and um, somewhere between the time that you get your education and you earn your money, you may or may not decide to move. Okay, so that's the kind of the idea. Um, now, I'm going to show you statistics in a bit that suggest that that actually is more or less the way it's working for, uh, for African Americans moving out of the South in the early 20th century. That most African Americans get educated where they're born, and then if they migrate, they migrate somewhere in their 20s. That's, that's going to be the general pattern. So that's, that's sort of the way to, the way to sort of think about, about what's happening here. Now, what about the education itself? Well, you're born with an innate ability, and I'm going to call that alpha. And there's a distribution of alpha. So, so some people are born with little, little ability, and some people are born with a lot of ability. And then and call out your human capital. And that, that's the thing that's going to help you earn money on down the road. Now you can augment that by getting additional education. So that's all those functions there, say, the, the, sub, the sub thing is just being the first derivative. The higher your, your alpha, the, the, the more your human capital. That's what that F function is saying. And then, and then, of course, education is a choice variable, in the, uh, or perhaps a better thought of it as a choice variable, pa variable for parents. But the point is, the more education you get, the, the, the higher your, your human capital as well. And it's kind of usual in this context to think of ability and education as complements, which means sort of a positive a cross partial to that, that function. Now, that wouldn't have to be true, but, but what it's saying is it's saying that, um, that uh, well, think about the education that we're talking about. We're talking about getting basic literacy and basic math. 
okay? So we're talking about no education versus four years of education or seven years of education or, or three years of education versus eight years of education. That's sort of the level we're talking about. And the idea is that a really bright kid benefits more from having gone to school than a kid who's not so bright. That's, that's what the second cross show. And again, it wouldn't have to be true, but, but in the, 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 the statistics I'm going to show you are consistent with that um, down the road. Um, and it's a pretty common assumption. Okay, that takes care of those first four, four, four points. The two points that are important here are, are the following. First, the return to human capital is higher in the north for blacks than it is in the south. So uh, 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 a bright, reasonably well-educated blind person moving north has more options to, to sell that human capital than they do if they stay in the south. That, I think, is a fairly... Uh, common way of thinking about this, and it seems to me it's probably true. Then there's going to be a cost of migration. That's certainly true. Um, um, what that cost is in the, in, in, in the real world was doubtless the, the psychological costs of leaving home, leaving your life behind. I'm going to think about monetizing that disutility and calling it M. And then you can lump in whatever the additional costs were, like the, the monetary costs of getting to the railway, and getting resettled, and so on and so forth. But that's M. Okay, so just keep thinking all simple. We're going to lump those all together. All right, if that's your model, um, I'll show you a little bit of math in a second, but you can kind of see where this is going to go. There's this distribution of alpha. And people that are high alpha, clear over here on the right, they, they also, in addition to being born with ability, they get a bunch of education, so they're going to be quite high ability. People with low alpha, they're going to tend to get lower education. The high alpha people are the people who find it most useful to move to the north. That's William Farr's idea of selected migration. If those same people tend to also have better mortality, more survival. So you're saying there are people that are positive selected, the healthier people over here. There's people that are less uh, uh, well selected, they're over here. And, and in my model, these people are also um, getting less education. Um, and I actually think in Farr's conception as well. That's, that's going to be the setup. Okay. Oh, and then there's going to be some alpha hat right in the middle, and if you don't add any stochastic concerns, this is going to be deterministic, everybody from here on up migrates, and everybody from here on down doesn't. Okay, so it's, it's that, that's the, that's the setup. Now, you can throw some math. Um, yes? Yes? Does it make much difference if the, if the cost of migration is fixed, or, as opposed to if the cost of migration depends on alpha? Does it matter for your model later on? Um, I, no, I don't think so. No. No, I don't think so. Because I think one could quickly imagine contexts in which the, the cost of migration would also be related to alpha. What are you thinking of, Jim? Well, for example, if you're, if, say, it's parents' investment in children, the parents' investment in children increases their education, say that those families are tighter, more closely knit, you're, you have stronger relationships with your family or your siblings if they've invested more heavily in you. Or, or you just have better job opportunities in the South, too, if you have time. <coughs> West in the north, but still higher than the bellwood. Or similarly, if, say, in the extreme case, say it's, it's parents who have fewer children who decide to invest heavily in their children, then the cost to you of leaving your parents when, when you don't have a sibling to leave them with, it just might be more, more difficult. Yeah. So, so none of what you said, I think, is going to worry me. Uh, we'll, right. we'll see. We'll see when we get the uh, we'll, when we get to the theory. Um, uh, so, certain high ability people do even better in the South. Um, that's certainly not, as you'll see, not going to fit into my formal model, right? Because what we're going to get is a high ability people at the very high end all move. But I don't think, I don't think that, that, I don't think that it's a problem if you throw in a stochastic term that's, that's, and this is going to be the crucial point, that's independent of where the railroads are, right? We'll, we'll see this in a second. That's not going to be a problem either. Um, we, 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 we do, I'll, I'll show you where the problem is, where we get to deep water, and it's, it's, it's soon enough. Um, um, but I, I, think, I think all of those actually be just fine. Um, yeah. um, okay, well, so, uh, uh, I, I, this, is a, this is a set of slides that we, we've all shared, um, so I gave the talk, and then when I first flipped these open, I saw this, and I thought, wow, where did that come from? So Seth was nice enough to work out a, a, uh, an example for us. So, whether you consider this nice or not, I don't know, but here it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's A, it's human capital, the function is, is kind of this Cobb Douglas thing. And so it meets, it, you can just stare at it, you can see it meets everything you need. Mm -hmm. Higher alpha means that you're, you're going to have higher human capital. Higher education means you're going to have higher human capital, but it's sort of diminishing because it's we're taking square root of it. Okay. So then you just yada, 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 work through the math, and sure enough, what you end up with is this thing. 
is that you move as long as your alpha, the alpha that you, ha you, you were born with, is bigger than some hat. And that hat thing depends on, on the cost of migration. That's not surprising. Right? It's cheap to migrate, but you know, like the hat's going to be up higher and so on. Or, I'm sorry, down lower, because you can grab more of the distribution. And then, of course, the whole thing hinges on the wage being higher in the north and the south. Otherwise, this isn't going to work. Right? The, 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 the class, exactly the same. So the whole thing would make any sense. So here's the, here's the picture from this particular example. Um, the, the, the pictures actually would work more generically too, but, but here's, here's the idea. So remember, there's this whole distribution of alpha. So these are high alpha, and, and just because of the way the Cobb-Douglas thing does, it's actually linear in alpha squared. So there we go. Um, uh, that certainly wouldn't have to be true. But the point is, here's alpha hat. High ability people will find that their utility, right? This, this red line is actually, well, it's earnings, but, but earnings translate in the economist parlance to utility, of course. Um, uh, uh, actually, it probably seems right. More money is better than less money. All, all that was equal. So that's that's the idea. Okay. So so anyway, people from here on out. Okay. Here's okay. Let's just let me slow down. <laughs> the higher my alpha, the higher my utility. That's true in the south, and that's true in the north. But in the north, it goes up faster in the slope because I'm earning a higher wage on my alpha and augmenting it with education. Now then. The thing is, if I move north, I, in, I incur a cost, call it M0. So <clears> for a low ability person, it's a bad idea to move. Right? So here, for people who are low ability, being in the south looks better than being in the north. That, that cost is too big. There's an alpha hat such that, from there on out, being in the north is better than being in the south. And that's, the, that's sort of a, yeah, example of that thing. Okay, now, here's why this is all useful for anything at all. <clears throat> It's because it's going to set up uh, what's 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 going to happen next. And again, this is this is set up. I would have no way of doing that. But I'm, very, <laughs> I'm actually kind of I'm actually kind of pleased with it. So so here's here's the way to think about it. Take those people and do the following experiment. Um, reduce the cost of moving north. What would happen? Well, the cutoff changes spots, and now more people end up moving north. Okay, so, so now the cutoff is, is lower than it would have been otherwise because the cost goes down. All right, this is where the railroads go in. Think about somebody living, uh, you know, 40 or 50 miles away from a railroad. So they're down, okay, the, the, the way that, the, Mississippi is kind of a perfect test bed for this. In fact, we started this paper by just using Mississippi. So there's, it's a big state, there's big, big areas where, where there are no railroads at all. So you're, 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 and, and, and you're there because your parents are there, and your parents are there because their grandparents were, were slaves there. And so that, that's where you are. You're 50 miles away from the nearest railway. The idea of moving north would be quite daunting for somebody like that. The logistics would be daunting. And the idea would be, would be foreign. If you live on a town that happens to be on a railway, again, you live there because uh, your, your grandparents were born there, your parents were born there, and, and in the meantime, a railroad's uh, plopped through, the cost is lower. It's, it's, it's obviously monetarily lower, but it's also lower because um, uh, newspapers, black newspapers from Chicago are being delivered. And you're getting an idea of where jobs are, and, and, and it becomes less daunting. And then, by the way, it probably reinforces itself because your brother goes, your uncle goes, and now you've got a neighborhood to move to in Chicago. And so, so the point is, these people are the ones that are on the railroad, and these are the ones that are not on the railway. And so what we're going to have in the research design is... is for these people, these are the always movers. The high ability people are going to move no matter what, in our conception. At a stochastic term, and, and they mostly move. But these people always stay in the South. The low ability people, whether they're born on the airway or not. But for this group, this is a group where we can actually make some headway. And if, if, if there's a causal effect to be had, we can say, these people move if they're on the railway or not on the railway, and then, and then potentially there's a causal effect. Now, to, to get the instrument to work right, here's what's really crucial is there's a distribution of alpha, right? There's a distribution market behind here. It could be bell-shaped, for instance. And what we're going to need, and this is, this is where we deep, we're going to deep territory, we need that distribution to be the same for people born on the railway and off the railway. That's the, that's the idea. And so I do want to come back and talk about that and then talk about what happens if we violate that assumption because that, that seems pretty crucial. Um, okay, so there's, there's a setup. Now, with all that in mind, all we need to do is just translate that setup into notation that allows us to take the, uh, take the idea to the data. So um, let y be the outcome of interest, and, and our outcome is going to be survival to old age. Um, so, so, um, 
So, so what we just, just, just to be clear, let me back up. Uh, just to be clear, what we're going to say is these people have higher earnings, but um, we suspect that these are people who, if, if William Farr's idea is right, these are people who are going to have good survival, and these are people who, regardless of where they live, are going to have bad survival. And then, and then our idea is to try to figure out what happens here. Okay, so uh, 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 heading down. The, the, the outcome of interest is survival to old age. Um, um, I'll tell you what that means more precisely in a moment. People can either move north or not. Um, so so if, they, if the, the destination is zero, y would be y zero. If the destination is, is one to the north, it would be y one. And of course, we never observe both for any one individual. That's the, that's the counterfactual that we uh, uh, would like to be able to recover from our, our, um, our procedure. Z is our instrument. Um, it indicates birth in a railway town or a non-railway town, and, and, and that's predetermined in our setup. That, has to, you know, that, has, that we have to believe is predetermined and the distribution is the same, in fact. That's this point of Z being independent of, of, Z, of y, y1 and Y0. Um, Z being 1 reduces the cost of migration, so increases the probability of migration. That's going to be the uh, key idea here. Um, uh, so, remember our picture, we had the never movers, they were all the way over to the left. We have the always movers, they were always the over in the way on the right, and the compliers um, are the people kind of in the middle. And this is the, this is the, no, this is the uh, terminology that uh, Angus, Evans, and Rubens use in that uh, famous uh, JASA paper. Uh, the compliers are people who, who get the treatment, okay? The treatment in this case is, you're born in a railway town, you're given every opportunity to move north. Some take the treatment and move north, and some don't. Those are the people who we're going to hope to make some headway on. And if our basic story, and it's not ours, it's really kind of uh, William Farr's story is right, we would expect all of this to be true. That, that remember, we can't observe it, all of this, but, but if we could observe, we, we kind of expect these, these never mover guys are going to have lower survival anyway. They're, they're the most average to select it. The C guys are kind of in the middle, and the always complier or the always movers are the ones who would have been on the far right side anyway. So this is a the selection mechanism that I kind of think might be lurking in the background and that we have to worry about. Okay, now with all that in mind, um, here's the thing: some of them we can never hope to, to test because, like an always mover, you'll never know what their mortality would have been in the south. But these are the ones we can get. So. Um, Expected value of y1, now remember y1 is survival in the north. Um, if you're an always mover, um, that's easy. Right? You just take that directly to me, right out of the data. It's just the survival who were people off the railway, but who moved. Right? So the idea is you're born off, you're born 50 miles off the railway here, you move north, you're an always mover. There's no circumstance under which you wouldn't have moved. All right, now, let's stop right now. What has to be true then? is that for any individual who moves north, given that they were born off the railway, they would have also moved if they'd been born on the railway. If you don't like that assumption, we're in deep trouble. That's, that's absolutely crucial. And th this is an idea that, 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 that's been well known um, since IV's been um, well, formalized uh, by, by Rubens, Ibbins, Angrist. Um, a little bit of, of non-compliance might be okay, but if we have a lot of non-compliance, the whole design is doomed to fail. So what we really, to just say it again, people who were born off the railway and moved would have moved anyway had they been born on the railway. That's going to be the idea. If we so, walk by so that. The, so the return to education is the same off the railway and on the railway? Uh, well, the return to, abil to ability. ability. Yes. Well, and, and bear in mind, in the end, we don't even observe. I'm going to show you some wage stuff, but we can't. We can't do all this causal stuff with the wages. It's going to be really a uh, survival that matters. Right, so, but it's not. It's not, for example, that it, when you showed before that, that we assume that the return to education is higher in the north than in the south. Yep. But it's not that in the south on the railway is intermediate between the two. Not at on all. On the railway and no. off. No. And so, if, right. it, if there were a difference, that might be a problem. That might be a problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I mean, it seems to me the main story, other, well, related story would be that your same model and theory about yep. what's governing the south-north migration is also governing migration within states from rural areas to urban areas. And you have the social selection of the people living near the railway, I'm assuming, are they tend to be, the railway's probably going through bigger cities, bigger towns, yep. and so there are people who are moving from rural areas to the urban areas next to the railway because they get a higher return yeah. and so on. 
And so uh, it's not clear to me that that poses, well, it poses a problem for the distribution of the alphas, yeah, well, I guess. But I'm, I don't know whether it poses any problem that's a really serious for your setup. Yeah, we, we thought about this for a long time and, and decided to think of it this way, to think of, of, of migration uh, north as a special thing we want to study. And that migration um, within the South would be considered like not moving at all, which of course isn't quite true. Um, like, so what, what 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 the data tell us is that is that there's a fair amount of, of rural to urban migration, uh, yeah, rural to urban migration even within the South. So people moving from <coughs> northern Mississippi to Memphis, um, a big migration from Georgia actually into Atlanta. And, and so forth. Those people are still going to be thought of as being the people not willing to make the big jump to north, and therefore more likely to be in the lower um, uh, tail of distribution. So the way we the way we resolve this empirically, I'll show you in a minute, is we're going to look at the deep south. The five there's going to be five states we study. They're not border states, so that we don't have to worry about like people move to the border. We're still not going to count them. I mean, then the worry would be, what about people living in Kentucky who moved to Indiana? But we're not going to we're going to exclude them. So that was the way we decided to treat it. But yeah, you have to, as a conceptual matter, you have to think about not migrating out of the south as being uh, different than migrating north. That, that, that longer distance is the one that we're sort of capturing. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, seems to me that, that within the south, things are interesting too, but we haven't tried this at all yet. Um, the interesting thing is, is in the south, there's still, a lot, even today, um, uh, these people are, are, some of these people that we'll see in our data are still alive today. Um, but, uh, uh, of course, even among younger generations, there's lots of uh, uh, rural um, uh, residents among blacks in the south still. So I was actually surprised to, to look at a map and see how much there is. Uh, not in the north, uh, not nearly as much in the north. But anyway, we're, that, that's how we're handling it. So think about it if you can. You had a question or comment? No. Okay. All right, well, so how do we proceed? Um, this is easy. We just direct this direct from the data. This is easy. These are the these are the never movers. Um, these are people that were born on the railway and don't move. They're, they're just not going to move. Okay, so, so we can get their survival. We can get their survival. Um, now the never movers and compliers, a union of that set. Um, these are these and and people that remain in the south. That's easy. That's just all non migrants. So these should just come, recover directly as means from the data. Okay. Um, now the good news is you can just uh, 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 these probabilities are very easy. Right, this is just the, the fraction of all people born in the South that don't move. Right, they're they're the they're the um, people that are the never movers and the compliers that never move. Uh, the compliers are the ones that um, uh, uh, do move. Oh wait, wait, wait. let me be careful. Um, I knew I'd run into trouble, so I wrote this down. Um, oh yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's fine. This is this is portion not moving. Um, uh, 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 among non-railway towns, yeah, that's, let's be careful here, right? So, so in the non-railway towns, there's two kinds of people, right? There's the never movers, ones that wouldn't have moved even if they were in the railway town, but there's some who would have moved had they been in the railway towns. Add them together, that's this group. These are the compliers, and we get those right from the railway towns. So this ratio is easy. This we know. This we did, we 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 can, we can calculate by subtracting this from that. Give it that, and then we're there. This, so this, this like a, um, you know, high school freshman you get, I guess. If you just sort of do the Venn diagram, make sure you get the probability all right, and you're sort of good to go. So, so that's it. That's awesome. Now we've got the the expected survival for people who are born in a railway town but stay in the south, and we can do exactly the same thing, same same exact kind of thing for, for people who move north. And and then of course what we really care about is. What the causal effect is, so, so the causal effect, this is, by, this is a typo, so erase that wide from your mind. The causal effect is, for people born in railway towns, there's the compliers, the people that stay, the C, the C group where you can, we have compliance. Um, there are the people who stay in, go to the north, the people who stay in the south, and, and just do math, 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 and it turns out <laughs> the whole thing boils down to that. It's like amazing. Um, that's called the Wald Estimator. Um, actually, went back and read the paper by Wald, and I, there's nothing like that in that paper, but it's, <laughs> sort, of, sort, of, sort, of, sort of a vague idea there. And, and, and it's always better to credit somebody way in the past against one of your current intellectual competitors. <laughs> so, uh, so in any event, it's now, by now, very, very well. This is, a, this is the simplest example of what's now known as an IV estimator or, or local average treatment effect. 
And so there's just two, two no, no things that, that, that make it useful for us to have gone through this, this, this whole exercise. So one is to just emphasize how important this independence is, the independence of where you're born. Second is, what we're getting is a local average treatment effect. So what we're not getting is the causal effect for everybody who might have been induced to move north or not. Like it's not, what we haven't done is taken a random person and moved them north and see what happens to their longevity. Instead what we've done is we've got this, this middle ground people who were born in, 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 um, in railway trains and decided to, to move or not move. But the good news is it's kind of the middle of the distribution. That might be more interesting. That might be the kind of, if you could pick, if you had to pick either one end of the distribution or the other in the middle, I guess you'd pick learning about the middle. Anyway, but anyway, that's all we're getting. And then the second thing, and this is really important, and it, and it reflects back to something you were saying a bit earlier, is it most definitely includes any behavioral response. So if you're, if you're, born, in the, if you're born in the South and you decide and you're on a railway town, let's say, or even not, it doesn't matter, and you're thinking to yourself, I want to move north. I don't know when I'm going to be able to pull this off, but we're moving, me and my family, we are getting out of this town whenever we can. Your response starts right then for how you treat the rest of your life. Right? So now all of a sudden becoming literate becomes more important, and, and, and learning how to uh, work with numbers becomes more important. Educating your children, because you know your children are going to have to be able to sell their human capital in the north, whereas in the south they'll be sharecroppers. And so, so the, whatever effect we're getting includes that. Uh, the, whatever the behavioral, lifetime behavioral response is being included. Oh, and by the way, whatever additional accumulation human capital get in the north, all of that is going to be part of whatever this causal effect is that we're measuring. Can I go back to, and what's the mean of D? Um, two, uh, two bullets. The, in the denominator. Oh, 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 oh. Um, D is the decision to move north, and so the mean is the fraction of people moving north. So okay. this is the fraction of people moving north, the fraction of people staying in the south. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I don't because I never did define that. In railroad towns and not. Uh, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So does the effect also include any effects of kind of changing epidemiology when you move from one area of the country to the other? That's going to be the causal thing. That's what we're going to describe. So, so the. The, 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 the causal effect is going to be, the, the, the way I sort of think about the experiment is, is, is I, come to, I come to you when you're young and I say, I'm going to move you to the north. And, and, and you say, okay, I'm going to move to the north. And, and you may or may not change your behavior in response to that. But if you change your behavior in response to that, that's going to be included. It's just like, it, I mean, it's really just like, um, it's, it's, well, and then just to finish up, and, and then, when you move to the north, you may be assaulted by all kinds of epidemiological uh, disadvantages or advantages. Better medical care, worse pollution, for example. That's the effect that we'll be measuring. But the point is that effect's going to include whatever response you make. And, and in this way, it's exactly like giving you a medication to take. So if, if I gave, if I, if, if I, you know, this is what sort of the point that Ruben makes is you give somebody uh, some medication um, and they, they take it. They may say, oh, now that I'm on this, this cholesterol-lowering medication, um, uh, you know, I better just go in all in and start exercising. And if on average people do that, whatever effect you measure of the cholesterol medication is always going to include that. Of course, it could be the opposite. You could take the cholesterol medication and you'd say, oh, now I don't have to exercise. Woohoo! Um, so, but whatever it is, that has to be included in the effect of, 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 of the treatment. So the treatment is moving north, but that treatment has to include, as a behavioral matter, we have no way of capturing anything else, um, has to also include behavioral responses that people make to have these movements. It's the whole new life that you have in the North. That, that's exactly right. This is the whole yeah. life that you had in the South. Right, and, and, and to tell you, tell you the truth, I, we figured what was going to happen now is we were going to get a big positive effect on survival. But what's going to happen is, is we'll, we'll, we'll solve the selection problem, and, and now, Everybody who moves north is going to get better medical care, earlier access to sulfur drugs, um, uh, less discrimination, and they're going to survive longer. That's actually what we thought we'd show at this point. And, and, and by the way, it's not what we show. So I'll, we'll get to that. But, but, but your interpretation is exactly right. So. The bar expected a negative effect in London because it was so crummy. Yeah. It was Dickensian in London, and so they were yeah. like, and we, we let's thought, move to town and die. All the, all the most able people it, it, kill it, them with. Exactly, and we, and we thought London would, uh, we thought Chicago was not London, not, yeah. but I mean, maybe it is. Uh, <laughs> so what are our data? The, the data were, um, originate from um, some work that uh, Jim Bopel did a few years back, um, where he got access somehow to the master beneficiary records of a, 
of, of Medicare Part B and, and got them to merge by Social Security records to um, uh, the new net files to SSA. So th these, are, these are pretty remarkable data. I don't think they've been used very much, um, in part because they're kind of unwieldy. Um, but, but they cover, uh, for, for one group, they cover uh, uh, 76 to 2001, and they cover 90% um, uh, of the population. Um, so who are these people that they're covering? Um, uh, uh, they're, they're covering uh, people age 65 and older, plus a few disabled people, plus some disabled people whom we have not studied, but, but who would be very interesting to study for somebody who wanted to dig in and do this. Um, uh, one thing we discovered is that for cohorts born before 1916, the match rate drops precipitously. Um, and for reasons we don't understand. So we get, eight, for our group, which are African Americans, we get 80 to 90 percent and, and sometimes above match rates for 1916 to 1932, um, but not for before, so we can't use them yet. And it could be issues having to do with whether, whether or not African Americans in those courts ever, ever registered for SSA numbers or, or, or if they were sloppily records. Or I, we, I just don't, I don't know. I actually shouldn't even speculate because I don't know. about the last bullet you're matching to the towns? Yeah, That's okay. So here's what we're going to, yeah, okay. So having been given those data, or given access to those data, here's what we do. So we, we know that people survived age 65. We observe, if they died before 2001, we know when. And, and SSA is going to keep very careful track of that, because they don't want to send out tracks to, to people who, who have died. Thing is, when you register for SSA, you're, you're asked to write down the, 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 town, the, the town and county of birth. And people just wrote those by hand in a 12-digit string. Um, somebody's typed those in, but you can imagine what a mess they are. So, so if, you, if you were born in Jackson, Mississippi, what would you write? Well, you might write Jackson, Mississippi. That would be ideal. <laughs> uh, you could write Jackson um, um, MS or MISS or just J-A-C-K MISS and so on and so forth. And so our goal was to match those 12 character strings to actual towns. And that's what turned out to be a pretty big job. Um, so, so, so this my my son was hired to do that, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so eventually, seventy million. <laughs> eventually, yeah, eventually. So, so the the cool. I mean, we, they tried all kinds of things. So the first thing they tried is they tried let's let Google do it because they're they're smart, and and actually try it. When you go on Google Maps and you start to type in a a, a city, even if you're kind of misspelling it, it's pretty good at, at getting it right. So they they, they sent. I don't know, 100 of them, and Google did great. They sent 1,000 of them, Google did great. They sent 2,000 of them, Google said, uh, well, we're not going to do more free work for you. <laughs> so um, and they have a way of figuring this out. So they, they string together like 70 computers to send them from different IP addresses. And Google's like all over that. <laughs> Their people just do that instantly. Like they just won't do free work. <laughs> As it turns out, um, these guys down at Duke ended up writing their own algorithm that worked much better than Google. Um, because it's very specific to names and places, whereas Google is doing stuff more generically. But anyway. yeah, I, the, the original Social Security sign-up was conducted by postal workers. And okay. you had to be on a postal route, and a postal worker had to be willing to sit down with you, if you're illiterate, and get this information. So, you, so they lost a lot of people, particularly older people, maybe black people, maybe people who are black and yeah, <laughs> we end up with we end up with pretty we end up with very high match rates. But bear in mind, we're we're looking at people who were born on um, um, 1916 to 1932. That's going to be our sample. So they weren't old when they were registering. They would have been young when they registered. It, but it doesn't change your point that there could be some selection even then. So so you want to think about a 20 year old registering in the 1950s would be our typical or, or 18 year old registry. You also didn't, as you know, didn't register when you were a child. You registered when you entered the labor force, if then. Um, uh, or in 1936. Or 1936, in which case we're back to the problem that you recognized. And so the consequence of that you're going to see in, in a bit when we get to the uh, to the regressions, uh, which I better get to, um, you know, we, we end up missing quite a few people where you just end up writing down the county or, or writing down a rural route which I guess isn't too surprising given what you just said. So then it's no good to us. We can't, we're not going to be able to place them on or off a railway. Um, okay, so then we, we just put the, the, the 20th century railway maps on, on GI, using GIS. We have some vital statistics that we'll use for some of our work and some census uh, data we'll use for some of our works and all that, just some sort of standard stuff. So finally, results. Um, first question, um, where do these, you know, how many of these people moved and where did they move? Let's use census data to answer this. 
Take the cohorts we're going to study with the with the uh, uh, with the uh, Medicare data, but first start using census. And here's what we have: uh, out of the deep South states that we're studying, you know, especially in Mississippi, Alabama, and South Carolina, you know, half the people have moved uh, by the time um, that we hit 1970. Um, and, and what you notice is Louisiana is kind of an outlier there. The, the, okay, and these states are listed, by the way, in order. So, so uh, California, you know, maybe a half of people who migrate out of Louisiana move to California, and about a third to Illinois, and then a bunch of other states. Mississippi, they're going uh, up to, to Illinois. Um, Alabama, they're going up to Illinois, Michigan, Ohio. Um, Georgia and, and South Carolina, kind of along the East Coast. Um, uh, we then looked at our Duke SSA data, and, were, and, and in this case, now, um, even in 1970, we know the cities where they lived, because uh, at least where they lived when they retired. And so we just do it by city, do it a little bit differently. And first of all, these numbers are pretty similar. That's that's kind of it wouldn't have to be the same because they're different, you know, different ages and stuff. But but they're kind of similar, and and certainly the pattern's the same. People in Louisiana going up the West Coast and so on and so forth. Is it because the railroads? We can't, we can't have people west? Yes, 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 it is. <laughs> so, uh, 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 thank you. Um, so, so what you see is we showed the the, the, the the main states from which these two, South Carolina and Georgia, go are here. Main states from here are here, and main states from Louisiana are out here. And just to give you a quick example, there's a an old map from um, what's uh, the Illinois Central Railway. You can tell it's old because. The writing's funny. <laughs> um, uh, so this is actually from the era where we have this map uh, shows what, what what's happening is is they just it's going from New Orleans up through big, <coughs> through uh, Jackson and then on up to to to, um, to Chicago and this one's coming up this side of the state and also going through Memphis and then up to Chicago. That's Illinois Central. Um, uh, it, on our map, it looks like this. It's not quite as uh, clean, but he here's here's that. Remember that spur coming off this way, and then there's this one coming up here. That's that's Illinois Central. And um, what this map shows is of people. Oh no no, of people born in these counties, of blacks born in these counties during our year, what fraction of them end up in Illinois? And by the way, Illinois is is Chicago in this case. All virtually all of them are are, are ending up in Chicago. <coughs> and you see, people along these railways are very very. These are quarter a third. This county right here, half, this is Holmes County, half of all people end up in Chicago, uh, born in our cohort. Um, and so huge fractions of people from this part are moving up to Chicago. And you say, wait a minute, here's a line going up on the right-hand side. It's also going north. Why aren't they moving to Chicago? Um, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, this is the Mobile um, and Ohio Railway. <laughs> this is an interesting railroad. Uh, but there's like a whole history out there about railways. Who knew? Um, um, and, and has a lot of amateur fans who go back and dig up. Like mm -hmm. this is this map. This was this railway was first proposed way back in like 1850 by people in Mobile who wanted to turn Mobile as the, the most important port in the Gulf Coast. So their idea was to, to build a line up to Cairo. This is Cairo, um, uh, Illinois, right here, and and they were going to offload uh, freight from. From boats in Cairo, ship it down to Mobile, and then from there to the rest of the world. That was the, that was the plan. It was a bad plan because because it's much cheaper to ship on water, um, even than railways. And so what happened is if you could get your freight on on water, you could just take it all the way down to New Orleans and be done with it. So it, it took them 50 years to get this thing built, and by, by the time they finally built it, and they got to Cairo, they were nowhere. I mean, it was it wasn't going to do them any good at all. So they just went on up to St. Louis. And so when you look at this side of the state, this is a fraction of people who live in St. Louis. And, and what's kind of interesting is both of these railroads, the Illinois Central and, the, and the, the, the Mobile and Alabama, they both end up in Cairo. So you could, and no doubt some people did, get off, get on this line here, go up to Cairo, get off, walk across the station and go to Chicago on the rest of the Illinois Central, or vice versa. But people didn't do it, right? You could buy a ticket here to St. Louis, you could buy a ticket here to Chicago, and an awful lot of people kind of just did that. And if you stretch out all these maps over all these states, it's just kind of cool. I mean, here's just one more example. Well, well, well we got like uh, two or three. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, these guys are going out to. I, I want to know what happens. <laughs> all right. So here's what happens. First of all, people are migrating when they're young. All right. So that's the that's the uh, uh, that's the sort of. These are people who stay in the south. And if they stay in the south, they there is migration, of course. Uh, like 10% of people move in other states. 
But people who move north, they're most, most likely to do so, um, well, either with their parents when they're young, but much more likely on their own when they're in their 20s. Um, there's nothing new here, I mean, except for just it's putting tables that look a little different than, than what you might have seen. These are regressions where it says, if you're born in South Carolina or Georgia, for instance, what's your earnings if you stay in the South, and what's your additional bump up if you instead move north? So there's nothing causal about these. These are just descriptive. But it's repeating what, what Tolney and many, many others have observed, which is moving north inc increases your earnings. Okay? Um, if you want to think of it that way, and it's true for everybody, but of course many, much of that's selection. Because, for example, moving north increases your education. You know, I mean, it's just that better educated people move north. People who move north have higher earnings, in doubt because they're better educated, partly, and in doubt because earnings are higher. Um, and in doubt because they're positively, or, or in all likelihood, positively selected on unobservable dimensions. So that's kind of interesting, and it's good to see that it's true for our group. All right, finally, results. So um, we have a million um, African Americans uh, that we uh, that were born in in in, in our sample states. Um, we're going to show survival to, from age 65 to 70, and then survival from 65 to 75. Obviously, we have a smaller sample because we have five fewer cohorts. To, to, to do, do, but you know that's 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 okay. Um, we have pretty big samples. Um, what we're doing right now is running in this regression a regression that that does almost exactly what our theory says to do. Um, uh, well, I, it's, it's a precursor to what our theory says to do, except for we're going to add uh, cohort by gender effects. That makes sense. We know women and men have different mortality rates. And you want those to even vary by potential cohort. So the cohort you're born in could matter, and then and then. Actually, it matters less than you'd think. Being born in the later part of this period doesn't help your mortality much. Um, but anyway, but being a woman, by the way, helps it a lot. Um, so that's where this kicks in. And that state of birth fixed effects, that, that doesn't much matter. Okay, so what this thing says, that's it. And here's a regression. And what it says is living in the north, your survival rate is almost identical as if you didn't move north. And that's really surprising. Because remember, people are positively selected in the north. They have higher education, they have higher earnings. Our theory tells us they should be higher, William Farr's idea. So that's what you get with OLS. Now then, there was this issue about do we know your exact town? And the answer is for about 250,000 people we don't because we know, we know the state they were born in and often the county but not the town. They're not going to be good to us because we can't form the instrument unless we know your town. So we drop those people and the good news is this coefficient doesn't change. So it's still getting a zero effect of moving north. And now we hit that thing up with our instrument. So our instrument is whether you were born on a railway, and, and we did it a couple of different ways, but the, the simplest way, and, and it worked just fine, was to say, you're born within three miles of a railway or not. That was it. And, and, and then we also did some dose response, like born three, five, 10, 20, and it worked exactly like you'd think, but, but this worked just as well, and so we just stuck with this. And the point is, the, the, you can see the T-statistics are going to be massive on these things. I and mean, we're getting marginal ass statistics of like a thousand. So, so um, we're, we're getting huge power. Being born on the railway greatly influences six percentage points higher probability of moving here, five, six percentage points probably moving back here. And now finally, this is a, the number we've been uh, waiting for. This is the causal effect, given our setup of moving north, and it's to reduce um, more uh, survival by about five percentage points between ages 70 and 75, uh, 65 and 70, and by uh, almost 10 percentage points. It's a lot. Right, so the base, the base here is, is around 0.7. Um, and then just everything else is, is, just, is just, oh, there's the power of our instrument. <laughs> Very powerful. Um, you can just try it by different states, and, and the effects are always negative. A little bit bigger in Louisiana, but the standard errors are big enough that I wouldn't make anything of that at all. And, sampling variation. This is interesting. Um, this may be the right way to start it. It's just do men and women separately. And what's kind of interesting, what's a little surprising to us, is it's, it's at least as big for women as for men. It looks kind of you know, a little bigger up there and kind of similar here. So, you know, it's going to be interesting. Um, oh, remember we said we could, we could those, those even aside from the, the instrument, we can we we said we could get what's happening for the compliers and not compliers, um, just separately. There's these inequalities without a hold. They they hold everywhere for both men and women. So that's 
just telling us the selection was working the way we expected. Um, lots of times in Ivy you can't do that, but for our problem you can, so we did. Um, can you go over that? Just clarify what? Yeah, so let's see. So, so the never the never movers should have um, lower survival than the, than the compliers. Oh, okay. So that's what this is for men. And then the always movers, we say, should be the guys that are sort of the healthiest. So, so these guys, should, this should be bigger than this, and this should be bigger than this. So at least we don't violate that, that, that assumption. Um, uh, and then there's just some other robustness stuff that I don't much care about. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll close with this. This is hot off the press. Um, because we don't know what the causal mechanisms are, like what, what's happening in the north, and we're trying to get some clues from looking at, at cause of death. So there's a better way to do this than what we do, but let me tell you what we do here. First of all, uh, it's a long cohort, so it's a slightly earlier cohort, so you need to update it using better, but, you know, match cohorts. And we want to do it for the whole Deep South. Um, actually, I think Seth has this done now. We just, I just don't have a copy of it quite yet. But these are people born in, in, in Mississippi, who end up in, 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 in Ill, either end up in Illinois or stay in Mississippi. Okay, that's the, that's the point. This is for men. It says men and women, but it's actually just for men. And then this one's for women. And what you notice for both women and men, what we're doing is we're saying, what's the cause of death in Illinois relative to the cause of death in Mississippi? Uh, having condition on age. So it's like just looking for the cells and matching them up. What you're getting in Illinois is twice as many deaths from, from, from liver disease and cirrhosis as from Mississippi. That was true for men and it's true for, for, for women. Now you say, you say, well, wait a minute. That's only the 19th most important cause of death, so does this really matter? Well, here's a possible story. This could be part of the story. I, I, I would be very surprised if it's a whole story. It could be part of the story. It's being born in the South uh, is it, it, it's probably really crappy for a black person in the early 20th century. Move north and la life is better on lots of dimensions, but on others it's not that much better. And furthermore, you've lost your family and your church, and, 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 and also you may have some more money. And so, so my suspicion is that there was uh, more smoking, right? We get more bronchitis and emphysema. There's probably more drinking. And, and most people don't die directly from drinking through cirrhosis, but, but we know drinking contributes to all kinds of, it's a, morta it's a risk for all kinds of mortalities, including many, many things like COPD and other things that are on this list. So maybe, maybe there's something to be learned from doing this more carefully, and that's our idea to proceed. Um, and so I'll just go to the last slide so you can see what it says. But I'll stop there. So I just have to point out, for I have a question, but, or a comment, but first comment, yep. pre-comment, is that on that last slide, you, know, you should notice that stroke, the third most common cause of death, 20, 22% lower. It appears. Yeah. You know, so I mean, your story about you've got a few examples that yeah. where there's a greater probability, but for, I mean, one and two are a wash basically. The first and second causes of death are a wash in terms of one's a little bit higher, one's a little bit lower. The third is is, is a big negative effect. So, yeah. My my more general comment had to do with whether I believe this whole result of the um, thing being lower or higher, and what what else might explain that. Yep. And um, I mean, you know, it's an old story that age misreporting uh, affects. Uh, mortality risks and the measurement of them. And as far as the, the issue of the social security number, I believe it was sometime in the 1960s when uh, they made the change where you had to present proof of your birth, birth certificate. There's some point where that became standard practice, I believe in the 60s, but I don't know if it was implemented differently in different states. But I mean, there's some chance that, that this all kind of comes back to the quality of the data that got reported for people in northern states versus southern states. I don't know for sure if that's the case, but I mean, it's, it's worth looking at, especially when you think that those dates that get recorded in Social Security probably happened when they first entered the workforce in those days. Would that be true? And if they were first entering the workforce in the north or the south, kind of the place where they're eventually going to live, then the quality of that reporting really could make a difference in, in the measurement of the, of the mortality rates much later in life. If there's a lot of imprecision in the southern data compared to the northern data, it can create yeah. an effect of lower measured mortality rates and therefore higher survival. In yeah, we were we were very worried about this problem, and and so so for example, um, I, I, by the way, just for example, the, these data are certainly subject to that. This is even worse. This is this is relative reporting age of a deceased person, 
And so, so I, I'm, I'm actually not trustful of, the, of these at all. Um, so we went back and we read, you know, this, this work by Creston and, and others that built on building on it. And, and so the, the big problems with 1840 certainly are in the census. Um, they're certainly in these days, these kinds of data. Um, they seem to be lower um, in, in Social Security and in, in Medicare and lower for the cohorts we're looking at. That's where the early part of the 20th century is it, it, so high. In fact, that could be about why the cohorts be before 1916. But I, I take your point. I don't quite know what to do about it. I mean, we, th we think from having looked at, 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 uh, at sort of the validation studies that, uh, that, that uh, uh, you know, something that Medicare did, some, some long ago stuff, that, it, that that ages might be pretty good for our cohorts, but I don't actually know. Um, I mean, if you have some ideas of I, I, I understand. Sure. I, I certainly want to know how that change took place and whether it took chase place uniformly. Right, so, so what, what would have to be true for, for mortality to be, for mortality to be, well, you sort of have to think it through because the, the whole thing's being driven, right? It's not just north versus south, because we saw mortality's roughly the same for people moving more since north and south. It would have to be correlated with whether you're on the railways or not. Now, the problem is it might be because if, if records were better kept in larger towns than in smaller towns, well, and then you have to sort of think about what, you'd have to have age over-reporting in the larger, in the towns on the railway, because I mean, well, those people need to be older. No, it, might have it's just just error. it just needs to be error. No, 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 not, not, not in our context, not when you instrument it. I, I actually, I, we were talking about that, I actually oh, okay. pinned this down. I don't, I don't think it's that, it's not just age over-reporting error, it needs to be, Needs to be systematic one direction or another for people on or off the railway. But having said that, doesn't mean that doesn't mean you're you're wrong about your general point. So it's worth it's worth thinking about. Yeah. Do you have the proportion in defined uh, in defined cause of death among the different group of people in your sample? No, we don't. So that's you, that's, you, need, you need to die of something. No, that's exactly right. So all all of this is is at most suggestive. At most suggestive. The only way to do this right is to take our data and match them to cause of death, which, by the way, somebody at, at Medicare, Medicaid, Record, CMS knows. So this is not impossible. We're gonna we're gonna try to get some uh, well money. Um, and, 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 and by the way, I should have I should have yeah that's, I should have I should have acknowledged uh, uh, is a, an R01 did support this from NICHD um, this work up to I think we missed not putting that on the front slide. But, but it would be quite a bit more access to require to do that. So, yeah, that would help a lot. A stroke, for instance, it could be much better defined. Yeah, it is. You know, get more stroke death, but not because of yeah. the underlying. So, it was dangerous to throw this up, I probably <laughs> but, but, no, 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 you're exactly right. I mean, we just, but from this, it's very hard to know what to make. Uh, you know, maybe there's something behavioral going on, but may, maybe there's just a simpler story to be told, which, which was just, you know, I mean, I guess I do have one more slide that's kind of idea of like, maybe it's still London, you know, that the cities really are bad, even, even in the 20th century, for, for, for at least for African Americans moving in. Maybe the differential, we keep talking about, you know, the big towns on the, on the rail line and so on. The terminus is the big town. The others are on a more or less straight line. That's and, our argument. And so... That's what we need. Drop Atlanta, New Orleans, Mobile, and reanalyze re the data. You'll have yeah, bigger yeah. standard errors. Um, uh, I thought I thought this was on here somewhere. We did that, and it works uh, great. Uh, so we, we dropped all the towns with more than ten thousand people. So then, it's obviously getting rid of the terminuses. It's just those ones that are sort of randomly hit because they happen to be on a straight line between, you know, New Orleans and yeah. Yeah, it worked great. I, unfortunately, it's not on here. But no, that's good. That was okay. good. I think we'd better. Um,